Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Tuesday topic. Uh, today's topic is Meet the CNHP Board of Global Healthcare Engagement. I've got a few folks that are still coming into the room. And while their microphones are tuning in, let me go ahead and just plug a couple of uh, other ones that are coming up soon. I've just dropped into the chat the um, uh, Tuesday Topics uh, website, which has all these listed. So if you want to go ahead and register for one of these while we're sitting here talking, that'd be terrific. Uh, next week, we have Ethically Speaking Vaccine Testing Approval and Distribution. Uh, the week after that, we have Escaping the Trap of Memorization. Um, and then the week after that, we have Measuring Your Impact. Uh, all right. So I'm now going to throw it over to um, Jane Green Ryan uh, from the Board of uh, Global Healthcare Engagement. Jane, take it away. All right, Darren, thank you very much. And welcome, everyone. Um, this presentation today of um, inviting you to get a chance to meet our board members. You'll be hearing from several of us during the course of the presentation. Um, there are, let me advance my slides. So the, the purpose of our board is, as you can read, to create more opportunities to foster global engagement throughout CNHP. So as you'll see, when I show you our board members, we have people from nursing undergraduate as well as graduate, and then representatives of people from the rest of the college, including students. So today you'll be hearing um, from myself, my partner in crime, Kate Clark from the Dean's office, some of the other board members, Allison Russo, um, from the PA program and Jesse Ballinger, who's gonna be talking to you about a book initiative that we have going and Leah, who's gonna be talking about the role of the advisors. So at the end of this presentation, we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers. And um, I guess before I start, I just wanna go back one tiny second to this other, to the first slide to talk to you just for a minute about how within our board, our board is designed along the same model as the Board of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, meaning that all of the members of the board are actively involved in actual projects. And we'll be describing some of those projects as we go through. So without any further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Kate and she can talk to you about some of the projects. Thank you. Unfortunately, I can't see this, the slides. However, I helped create them. So I believe I know what's going on. Okay. Um, so as um, Jane mentioned, our board is modeled off of the uh, CNHP Board of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion. And one of the very clever things that they did was they had all of their board members work on different projects. So it was a requirement. And so at each meeting, uh, we meet monthly. Um, each person talks about the project that they're working on, and we all brainstorm and see if we can help them out to move their project forward. Um, so we were going to go over some of the projects that we're working on, highlight a few. There are many, um, because as you saw in the previous slides, we have a lot of different folks on our board. Um, the next slide, which I believe is the Dean's scholarship slide yeah is um something that we are uh th this was my project actually <laughs> um i worked on this I, uh dean gitlin put um out in 2019 10 scholarships for students to go on trips and what happened was we put it out and we received uh, several applications and uh, students went to um, on ICAs, um, intensive courses abroad, which is a is a, an experience during a break. Um, they went on service trips, and there was a student who applied. She was doing a co-op in Australia, so that was really great, and I think it made the difference for a lot of students um, in, in being able to to go on these trips. And we're excited to announce today that we will be offering ten more. I know it's difficult right now because. A lot of the programs are still uncertain um, if they're going to be happening this year, but there will be scholarships um, for students to travel, most likely in the fall and winter when everything opens up. 
Um, so that's exciting and we'll be putting an announcement about that on our website. Um, but yeah, speaking of Dean Gitland, she did create this board um, to promote global engagement and we realized that this was one of the obstacles um, to getting students to go abroad. On the next slide, um, as you'll see, there are a variety of ways uh, students can go abroad. And you'll be hearing more about how you can learn more about them. We've created a centralized location on SharePoint um, for you to learn more about them, what they mean, like what exactly is an ICA or global classroom. And you'll hear more about that today. Um, but yeah, so there are a variety of different ways and we are trying to promote them um, by CNHP faculty creating these opportunities so that students don't have to go to say an architecture course because they want to travel to Singapore, they can actually go with Dr. Carey uh, in the winter. So we're really promoting the creation of these types of trips at CNHP and we're helping to build the capacity of our faculty to, um, to be able to, to create these opportunities. Um, and you'll hear more about that as well later. Um, the next project, I'm actually going to pass it over to my colleague, Allison. Um, she'll introduce herself um, and talk about her project, which was on global classrooms. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, sure. So my name is Allison Resco. I'm one of the assistant clinical professors in the physician assistant department. And the project that I took on when I first joined the board was global classrooms. Um, I took this project on prior to the pandemic uh, and, and kind of travel being shut down, but uh, it's become increasingly more important and really an aspect that we've been focusing on um, over the past year, year and a half now. Um, and the reason why I personally selected this project was coming from my department where our students have a really rigorous curriculum and not a lot of flexibility for um, chances to, to go abroad other than some service trips, wanting to find a way to really increase global opportunities and global engagement within um, the physician assistant department, but also within CNHP departments that might also have similar curriculums where it might be challenging for students to, to go abroad for long periods of time. So I um, have been working closely with Adam Zahn from um, kind of who works with global, um, the, I'm forgetting the entire uh, acronym of his office at the moment, but Adam is one of the directors for the Office of Global Engagement um, from a university level. And Adam and I partnered to really get a better handle on global classrooms and kind of ways to expand this within, within CNHP. And they're just a great way for faculty to um, use what they have in their existing syllabus for their existing courses and figure out ways to gain an, um, an international partner at Adam's office in the, um, in the university can really um, help foster those relationships if you don't, if a faculty member might not know who to, who to turn to, but they're just different ways to create touch points, um, you know, several touch points throughout your course uh, where students can participate in activities, whether it's synchronous or asynchronous based on the, the time difference between you and your collaborators collaborating institution. Um, students can participate in co-teaching sort of lectures, as well as creating projects and working on other collaborative um, activities between our students, as well as the students at the partner institution. Our university also helps out a lot with technology. So we want to make sure to mitigate that barrier for our faculty members, as well as the faculty at the, at the partner institution. So there's definitely support for our faculty in terms of technology, in terms of assisting with um, um, you know, uh, in uh, locating that international partner, if you're not sure of who of who that might be and, and where to where to kind of gather that. And then there's also opportunities for these global classrooms to morph into other things. So maybe that could be a research opportunity for us as faculty and the partner faculty, as well as expanding the global classroom to, you know, take place at um, not only in your course, but maybe other courses in your in your department as well. So that's kind of one way that we're using global classroom um, to kind of expand those opportunities. Adam and I I have conducted some department level meetings to try to make more faculty aware uh, or attended some department level meetings to kind of make more faculty aware of that opportunity. And we've had some, some pretty good response so far and, and Adam's office as well as myself and, and my colleagues on the board are always happy to serve as a resource if, if other faculty should have questions about how to begin the journey to, to developing um, a global classroom. Okay, 
and I will um, transition right into sort of um, an offshoot of, of the global classroom, but this is also a, vir a virtual experience. This is a virtual um, ICA that our board is also involved with. I definitely want to call your attention to the, the box on the left and give a shout out um, for tomorrow afternoon, so Wednesday the 27th from 3 to 4. Um, there is going to be an information session um, with a Haji. Uh, where we're, where there's going to be an opportunity to learn about um, a virtual ICA in terms of professors from architecture, business, environmental science are going to be basically talking about methodologies that were used to transition our ICAs or intensive courses abroad that can't really um, run in their exact same format given given the travel restrictions. So there's been methodologies now in place to transition those to be virtual experiences um, to kind of make these ICAs run um, during during our our pandemic. Um, and then I'll call your attention to one of our student board members actually took advantage of a virtual ICA. Um, I think that it began over winter break and it's continuing through into the winter quarter. And it was a course that is focusing on the ecology of Ecuador um, through the environmental science uh, department here at, at the university. So not only virtual classrooms are an opportunity, but also students have the opportunity to participate in, in virtual ICAs. And if we want to learn more about that, again, I encourage you to attend tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon session as well. So the next project we wanted to talk about is uh, one of our uh, board members, uh, Dr. Ballinger. He's going to talk about our CNHP community read. Hi, uh, thanks, Kate. Um, I'm Jess Ballinger uh, from the Health Administration Department and on the, uh, the board. Um, so our idea behind this was to um, create a book series that would um, find compelling, interesting, uh, engaging books that would could uh, connect uh, the entire um, un, un, um, college community with the communities that we work with um, around the world. So that that was the basic idea was to, to find books um, that would have some broad appeal and engagement and um, and use them as, as a way uh, to co connect the college community with uh, the communities that we work with. Um, I came to find out that um, Dr. Sharona Pearl, uh, who is also in the Health Administration Department and on the Board of uh, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, had essentially the same idea. So we decided we would work together uh, on what we hope will be a book series. And the first uh, book we chose um, is The Hate You Give by um, Angie Thomas, and I want to uh, say a little bit about that book. First of all, it's a, it's it's a book about um, uh, being African American in the United States. So so that is is one thing I, I would flag that we like to think about with um, global engagement. It's not it doesn't have to be peoples around the world. Sometimes we have to overcome differences and. Um, work to connect with communities right around the corner. So, uh, so that uh, this, this book uh, does that uh, in a very powerful way. On the one hand, um, if you, I have a copy of it on my desk, um, it, it might look like a, a very thick kind of daunting book. It, let me assure you it's not. On the one hand, it's very uh, accessible. It's, it's written to be uh, read by uh, a, a very broad audience. Um, but on the other hand, it is an emotionally really wrenching book, and I, I would want people to know that up front. Um, its central character is an African American, uh, young African American woman who, through the course of the novel, um, discovers and has to, to find a way to react to um, a growing understanding of structural racism following. Um, her witnessing of the murder of her childhood friend uh, by police, uh, an unarmed African-American man. So this resonates very deeply with uh, the traumas that we've been uh, going through uh, in this country for the past, uh, well, I could say year, but of course it's been a very, very long time, uh, decades and even centuries um, when you think about it. 
Um, so that's that's about the book. Uh, it's it's a fantastic book, and I hope everyone in the university community will read it. We will be aiming for a um, uh, a group a a, a a Tuesday topics discussion of it April twentieth, and the way we're going to set that up is to kind of um, avoid. Since since time is short uh, in these um, Tuesday topics, we want to uh, maximize the amount of time available for people to uh, for the entire community to talk about it. So what the way we're going to do it is we're going to have a panel who you might normally expect to take a good part of uh, the actual event uh, speaking, and instead of speaking at the event, they're going to record uh, their reaction to the book. Um, frame some questions for the college community to think about as they read it. Um, and those um, videos will be made available through uh, Drexel Media to the college to look at um, prior to uh, the meeting. So you'll be able to, and we expect those to be ready uh, by uh, mid-March. So there'll be a couple of weeks where we'll be uh, releasing these videos. I, I'm not going to give you the names of who's going to be on the panel yet because we're a little, we're still, um, uh, some folks are not quite sure they're going to be able to do it. Uh, but we will have um, undergraduate students, graduate students, uh, faculty, and staff. So we'd like to uh, represent the entire uh, community. Um, so I hope everyone is going to be able to uh, join us and uh, I, I um, yeah, look forward to to that event. Thank Thanks, you. Jess. Um, the next project we're going to talk about is a project that uh, was taken on by Elizabeth Yutzi. She and I both work in the dean's office and we help to staff the this board. And this is a project that's really part of the foundation of the board and it's really important to it. So Elizabeth. Thanks, Kate. Hi everyone, I'm Elizabeth. And like Kate said, I am a staff member in the Dean's office. So I'm gonna be talking about two projects. The first is the global SharePoint page, which actually was spearheaded by a former board member, Amanda Keene. So I just wanted to shout her out, give her credit for that. Um, so our global SharePoint page is kind of like the hub for all the information about global and global engagement um, at CNHP and about the board. And there's a number of different aspects to the SharePoint page. The first are helpful links, documents, and presentations. Um, so links to different areas of the website, uh, presentations that have been given in the past on global engagement. So I'm sure this presentation will be on there at some point as well. Um, there are also previous news stories. So these include aspects of our uh, newsletter that goes out, um, previous Tuesday topics, and other virtual events that have been centered around global engagement. Um, those are all on the SharePoint page. There's also a section for board members and the projects that they're working on. So if you're interested in any of the projects that you hear about today, you can go onto the SharePoint page and see who is working on that and as well as the other projects that haven't been mentioned today. Um, and lastly, we have the Global Student Hub. So this is a section of the SharePoint page that is dedicated to student engagement. So on that section, there are blog posts from students who have been abroad, uh, photos from previous ICAs or um, terms abroad, service trips, um, as well as links and documents specific to student travel opportunities. Um, so if you're interested in checking this out, you can find it by going to the Drexel, main Drexel SharePoint and looking for CNHP Board of Global Healthcare Engagement. That's the name of the SharePoint page. Um, so this can be a one-stop or the, the first place you go to if you have any questions about global engagement. Um, and if you can't find your answers there, then you can reach out to us. Um, the second project is the Global Context Inventory, and this was my project. So there are two aspects to the Global Context Inventory. The first is faculty and staff travel. So we've documented um, as much information as we have about faculty and professional staff travel experiences. So this includes um, who the faculty and staff were, what department they came from, 
um, where they traveled to, when they traveled, and the nature of their travel. So was it for a conference? Um, was it for an ICA or um, some sort of exchange? Um, and this can be really useful if you're looking to travel abroad yourself or connect with another staff member or faculty member who has um, travel experience in an area that you're interested. Uh, so we can set you up with that person who has been to the same area um, or an area that you're hoping to engage with so that you can um, learn more about it. And the second aspect are our global contacts. This list we're hoping to really grow and expand. Um, these are contacts that live abroad that are interested in collaborating with Drexel in a number of ways. Um, so we're hoping to grow this list um, so that we can continue to engage with our contacts abroad. Um, and this is particularly useful for faculty and staff who want to start to create new collaborations and new opportunities. Um, if you know generally what area of the world you're interested in, you can check out this list and see if we have any contacts there where you could start that collaboration. Currently, um, these lists are not available to the larger Drexel population, but if you're interested um, in searching these for um, experiences or contacts, then you can email cnhpglobal at drexel.edu and we can help you out with that. Or if you'd like to submit your own travel or submit any contacts that you have abroad, you can email us as well and we can do that for you. All right, I'll pass it back to you, Kate. Yeah, thank you. And another great thing about this list that we're growing of contacts abroad is that we are asking them when we put them on the list, if it's okay for them to be on our distribution list. So if we want, if we're doing an event we, and we want to send it to our contacts abroad, then we can get more folks online with us. Well, that's how it is these days, right? Um, our next project is, um, a variety of people have worked on these projects, but Jane is going to talk about them as uh, she's spearheading the Global Perspective series. So Jane, virtual events? Sure, absolutely. Thank you, Kate. Um, so the Global Perspective series is a perfect example of why we need as robust a contact list as possible. The way the Global Perspective series works is that um, the committee organizing it sends out a broad question to partners around the world, asking them about things like, um, how has the pandemic affected your nursing practice? Or what kinds of disruption have you seen in the last year relative to the pandemic or to other disruptions within your community? And the, the partners then send back via Zoom, just a small little 15, 20 minute Zoom video uh, discussing their experiences, which the committee then collates, arrives at themes, and um, presents to the public. And so our first one, the first time we did it, was in the summer, the Disrupting the Global Pandemic, Nurses Stories from the Frontline. We had nurses um, and some physicians speaking from all over the world. We had people from Sudan, from Pakistan, from other parts of Africa, um, a lot of people from India, people from the UK, and um, Germany, um, Ireland, um, Canada, I think I mentioned. So it was very interesting and it became the um, springboard from which we decided to do this as a quarterly event. So we just had our second one in a few days ago and it was absolutely wonderful. It talked about the global um, effects of disruption. We had people from Africa talking about uh, migration, forced migration within country or without of the country due to some of the civil unrest as well as the effects of the pandemic. So I invite you to come to our next one. It's going to be in April, April 15th. We have not yet, we leave it intentionally kind of undecided to see what interesting topics are sort of at the front of the wave of the way the world is changing as we progress through at such a rapid little clip. So um, that's the Global Perspective Series. The other collaborations that we've had are Tuesday topics such as this one, fabulous one on dismantling racism, the community read that Jesse just told you about, and the intersection between age, race, and class, how COVID has affected that. That was also in the summertime. 
So I encourage you to come to any of these events and you'll be getting notices about them in your emails. And if you ever have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. And Kate, I'll turn it back over to you. Sure, so we wanted just to say, talk to you a little bit about other ways that we can work with you. Um, we would love to be able to help you brainstorm, think about uh, creating global classrooms or, or intensive courses abroad, ICAs, or how to incorporate a global perspective in your course. Uh, we would we would love for you to come to a meeting if you have a question and we can all we can workshop your project together, um, which would be really fun. And so we definitely encourage you to reach out with us, uh, we, we, reach out to us about that. Um, in terms of incorporating global perspectives into courses, um, Dr. White and um, and some others uh, worked uh, together to create what we're calling global competencies for the board and for the college as a whole. And within that, we discovered that there is a wonderful manual that's kind of thick, but we did create a summary of it um, to help you think about how to incorporate global perspectives into your course that might not really be global. So Sorry, let me get back, I'm sorry. Sure, and so we would love to be able to um, connect you to that resource. Um, Yes, and excuse me, it was Dr. White and, and Cheryl Portwood. Thank you. Um, another way that we can help out is through letters of support. If you are applying for a grant or if you are thinking about a fellowship or a trip or something like that, um, one way we provided a letter of support was with the Spanish for Healthcare Professionals certificate, which is something new that Drexel is now offering. And we wrote a letter and we got a lot of information about student interest uh, via our wonderful uh, board member who is also an advisor, uh, Leah. Um, and so we would be able to write a letter of support for you if you, if you need one. Um, again, oh, here you go. Um, the Global Health Competencies for New Classes. This is the, the book that I was telling you about that we have a, a, a summary of that we would love to be able to disseminate. And we, I'm not sure if it's on our SharePoint quite yet, but we will make sure to have it there as well. And then we have three wonderful students on our, on our board at this moment. Um, and they have gotten together and decided that they wanna write stories about our work, about events we put on and so forth. So they've written some items for the Daily Dose and for our newsletter. And if you know of, uh, um, a topic that could be of interest or if you think that we should um, write about some experience or you'd like to be interviewed to be uh, in something about uh, your experience abroad, um, our students would love to write it up. So that's another way we can help out. And then our last slide is just that we wanna turn this over to our audience here and questions you might for, have for us or ideas that you would like to see the board uh, take on uh, this year and next year. So I'm gonna open it up and maybe while you're, while you're thinking of your questions, I will throw one at, out at one of our audience members, which is the opposite of what you're supposed to do. One of our board members, Leah, uh, is in the audience and we just wanted to talk about um, the role of the advisor uh, in influencing and encouraging students to go abroad. And so, Leo, are you able to speak and tell us about that? I think so. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. All right. Well, hello, everybody. So as Kate mentioned, I'm Leah Semelhek. I'm a senior advisor with College of Nursing and Health Professions. Um, so there's a number of different roles that advisors play in terms of global opportunities. Um, one is the advisor themselves being knowledgeable about um, what global opportunities are out there, whether um, it's upcoming deadlines or the scholar, like one of the scholarships that Kate mentioned. Um, so that's one of the ways that we support students. Uh, even though there is an education abroad uh, office, where a lot of times their first point of contact when they're thinking about exploring an academic opportunity. Um, the other thing is that sometimes students aren't sure that 
these types of opportunities are for them. They may not have seen themselves in doing this kind of thing, or they may not know people who have gone abroad before. So we can be a word of encouragement to students as well um, if they're thinking about going abroad or attending a global event, um, talking to them about what other students have done before and what they've gained from these experiences, and even talking about some common um, anxieties or worries that students have and talking through them with them. Um, and also advisors themselves being knowledgeable and being open to learning from global and diverse perspectives and sharing with students the benefits from that, particularly in um, health and nursing professions and what that perspective can bring to the students as well. So those are some of the things that um, I see as the role of advisor and um, working towards uh, communicating different opportunities to advisors um, and ways that we can continue to support students who are interested in uh, learning from a global perspective. Kate, I have um, following up on your idea of throwing questions out to the audience. Um, I have a question actually for Dr. Carey and Veronica, I'm wondering if you would tell us a little bit about your experience with an ICA, maybe tell us a little bit about more about how ICAs work and specifically your experience going to the Singport. Okay, sure, sure. And Jess, you know, feel free to jump in if you have anything to add, because I know Jess Ballinger had an ICA last year as well. Oh, as it, I'm getting, I'm like losing time. Was it last year? Was it 2019? I don't know. All right. So yeah. yeah, is that something? So um, in terms of, I'm not sure how many uh, persons here on the call are potentially planning a future ICA. So I'll try to map it out as linear as possible. So first of all, ICA stands for intensive course abroad. So it's very important to recognize that it is a course. And I viewed my development of my uh, ICA to uh, Singapore as a before, during and after. So before we left, we had meetings, which I scheduled with the eight students who were going. Now, there's a process for those students to be involved. They have to take or uh, submit a letter that sort of like says, why do you want to be here? Why do you want to go to this named country? And each one of them has a focus. Well, mine was psychiatric rehabilitation. So some persons were going from COFT, and some persons or some students were from other colleges, but they had an interest either in Singapore or they had an interest in psychiatric rehabilitation. You know, so there's a combination of students that actually went with me. Um, so that was the part of the before process. But when I was meeting with them before we left, some of the persons had never left the country before. Some students had never flown before. So there's a lot of conversation about what does it take to travel, right? So I'm putting on my behavioral health hat and I'm trying to help them to be successful before we even leave, right? So we had conversations about acculturation. We had conversations about humbling yourself because you're entering into a country that may be unfamiliar to you, yet you're coming as a guest to this country, especially as a guest to these uh, different programs that I had them visiting while we were there. Um, viewing it as a developing nation, not as a third world country, you know, depending upon where they're gonna have chances to visit. Um, and then also look at their own implicit bias. You know, there may be some biases that they're taking with them that maybe they're not gonna be as prolific as the US. You know, maybe they're not gonna be implementing psychiatric rehabilitation as well as the US is. So we're looking at some of the biases that students took with them as, as uh, well. So I'm trying to give you the window into some of that before process. I even had them looking at videos before we left about Singapore and about psychiatric rehabilitation readings. And I even had them do a scavenger hunt where they had to use the internet to locate 10 questions about psychiatric rehabilitation and 10 questions about Singapore. Again, then we would meet and have a conversation. And actually this was pre-COVID and we did it virtually because the students were coming from all over the place. They were maybe online students. So you're gonna have face-to-face -face students that are interested in an ICA. You also have online students. So I couldn't hold a meeting at Drexel per se if someone lived in Virginia or California, but when it was time to fly there, we would all meet up and then end up going together. That's another part of the before. Um, that's more of a um, working with the global department and the faculty to arrange and coordinate flights. 
So it's really kind of difficult to say, you know, we don't actually book the flights. We don't actually say, but I, I would say I'm flying out of Philadelphia and my flight is thus, and this is our one stop. So I had some students meeting me at the one stop. It's a little, you know, tenuous because you're praying that their one stop gets there, that they don't miss the coordinating flight. But those are the kinds of things that happen do the, on the uh, before part. Uh, let me see what else. So the scavenger hunt. Um, and actually in terms of their first time any, having any introduction to international programming. So, but again, not losing, uh, not losing the focus that this is a course. So all these things are being graded even from the performance the before perspective, right? Before leaving. So learning how to, how to travel, first time leaving the US, trusting them themselves, right? Sometimes first time away from family traveling, uh, what to pack, what not to pack, all those kinds of things. Then when we're in country, I gave them assignments. Now picture this, so we're all landing in Singapore. I think I had two students who came from the West and we had to wait a little bit at the airport for those flights to come in or their, their flight to get in. And then we all culminated and we all went over to the hotel together. Now, Dr. White went with me, Ebony White, because she wanted to learn about ICAs. And Jess and I were talking about feedback that I had eight students and it was difficult to navigate eight students. So it was really, I was so thankful to have a co-facilitator, if you will. Um, and I think that's a recommendation when you get to numbers of eight, 10, 11 students to have someone else to go along with you. So when we landed, I would do um, some in-country assignments with them. So we had meetings daily because we were going together to these sites. Now, the um, assumption is, unless you're really ill, that you're getting up, you're not there just to see Singapore, right? Although if you haven't been to Singapore, I recommend you do. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, but, you know, to get up and go with us to visit these sites that are implementing psychiatric rehabilitation. Now, just as a transparency moment, why did we pick Singapore? It's because I've been going to Singapore since 2014 and helping them to implement psychiatric rehabilitation. So they were at a celebratory moment to be able to say, oh my gosh, you think that we're doing so well that you're gonna bring students to us? So each day we had different programs that were showing how they're working within their behavioral health system for adults with serious and persistent mental illness. So they had daily tasks. They had almost like an in-country scavenger hunt to locate different things. They had daily assignments. So when they're listening, they're listening for key features of psych rehab that's being operationalized there. They had to participate in the day. So I had asked the presenters to, you know, to kind of include them in different activities and work groups. They weren't just watching the activities. They could be a part of it. And then at the end, they had a final paper so it was sort of a composite assignment so they could bring sort of artifacts from Singapore into their final paper, which was about a 15 page paper. So they had a whole quarter to get this, this done, even though the visit was, oh my goodness, how long was the visit? I forget how many days were actually there. I go so often, was it a week? About a week, give or take a day. Um, so they had about a week experience to see this and be a part of that. And then at the end of a day, which was about six o'clock. Now, when we started the week, the students were like puppies. If anybody's ever raised puppies, you know, they stay close when they're first born. And then as they grow and get older, they get further away from you. So the first couple of days, the puppies were right there next to me, but each one of them had their own uh, travel card. If you've never been to Singapore, their transit is remarkable. You don't need a vehicle to live in Singapore. There's a blue green line and a yellow red line. So one goes east, west, one goes north, south. You literally can't get lost. If you had a vehicle, you could navigate Singapore in three days. You can see the whole country in three days. So as the students started out, they were like, well, Dr. Carey, we're going to go with you and Dr. White. Then the next day, well, I think I got it, our little voyagers, I'll meet you there. By the third and fourth day, I'm like, look guys, you better be at such and such a program by 10 a.m., right? Because they're going off to breakfast together, they're getting their selfies on, on things, right? Um, they're having a great time. At the end of the day, the day was theirs. We ended about maybe 5, 30, 6 o'clock. They could take their transit cards. They could go all over Singapore. We had to pray over them that they came back and they'd be ready the next morning. Um, but it was a great experience for them. We had fun while we, we were there, right? So there's a fruit called durian. Uh, some of you might 
know what it is. It's a very smelly fruit, you know. So we had this taste video um, assignment where everybody there had to taste it. We learned about it as a part of the scavenger, scavenger hunt before we left. And you should have seen the students just like having a field day locating the, it didn't take long to locate it when you were in the flea market or in the little, um, in the like fruit stands or whatever, because you could follow your nose and find it. And they had to take a video of themselves eating it. So as the week was going on, all of a sudden my cell phone would go off and there's the video of this cluster of students trying it. And here's the video of this cluster of students trying it. Um, and so by the end of the week, everyone had, you know, tried it, et cetera. So, um, and then they had a chance at the end of the week before we left to thank all of our hosts. You know, um, they were incredible. They made, um, unbeknownst to me, they made a flag and they signed it all. Well, what I did was I gave everybody a US uh, flag and it was about like this big, you know, I had a, a whole, you know, a little handle and they took their flags. And I said, as you meet people who probably have not been to the US and may not come to the US, you might be the first US person they've ever met. If you thought that their presentation was really good, you could write on their flat on the flag and say something and hand it to them. Well, you would think I'd given them gold pieces because they really, they, they held their flags close to the, the uh, vest. And when they went to one of the presentations that they liked, they would give the flag and they'd sign it. And the person was like, oh my God, I didn't expect anything, let alone, oh, you were really good. I learned so much from you, blah, blah, blah. And then at the end of the week, they gave me this huge flag that had all of their little sayings on it. So of course I kept that. Um, but those are the kinds of things that the students can possibly do. So as you're thinking about what your ICA could look like, I found that that before the scavenger hunt, the websites, the URLs, the readings, the articles worked out well. They were prepared even how to travel, the in-country, keep them close for a couple of days and then let them start voyaging around if you feel as if it's safe to do so. Singapore is oh, so safe um, to actually do so. Um, and also in terms of when they return, then they have their assignment that they, that they already know in terms of the final paper, et cetera. So if I can answer any questions about that or Jess, if I missed anything, please. Uh, oh, I would endorse everything you said. Um, uh, absolutely, I think, uh, particularly with a trip that that's, that's so short and so intense preparation ahead of time you know, we went to Chile, uh, and and there, the knowing the history was absolutely essential. You know, it was focused on aging, but knowing uh, the particular history of, of traumatic history of Chile that would have been, you know, writing the experience of of older people was essential. I don't want to go on too much, though. Oh, the, the one thing I would say is one thing I was really happy. I, I think was essential. We we you know there was it was just like you know such a sipping at a fire hose type of like so much was crammed into it it was really crucial uh we had uh the the, the assignment there i had them to basically keep a, a a diary and have a kind of a critical reaction um journal uh assignment that was like because i knew it would be very hard to remember this but i don't want to go on too much more because i i noticed um Actually, one of the students uh, on the ICA was on the trip, and I have asked her if she'd be willing to say a couple of words about it, and she would. So, um, Nicole Bespalov, if you're um, still out there somewhere, if you could uh, say a little bit about what the experience was like for you. Yeah, no problem. Hi, everybody. I'm a uh, senior nursing student here at Drexel, and uh, Dr. Carey, after your speech, it's a little hard to follow up with my experience, but... Um, so Chile honestly was incredible. Um, pretty much from day one, the things that we were learning were so hands-on. And um, I think my favorite experience of like the whole trip was when we got to do this kind of um, like walking audit tour with some of the students. I think it was at the University of Santiago. And that was, I think the, it was just so interesting just to kind of hear. So my Spanish, um, experience is very kind of minimal and I guess that's kind of one of the things that with an ICA language requirement you know do you have a language requirement do you not I would say that honestly no I think that communication is such like an easy thing between humans even if you don't speak fluently so obviously I mean that was a really cool experience um let's see 
We did a lot. I mean, like that week was jam packed. Jesse, Kate, and Doc, and the Dean, you guys just did an incredible job at planning the whole trip. Um, our like culminating project was to pick a person, a place, and a thing that kind of like really uh, like stuck out to us the most in Chile. And I thought that was um that was a good experience just to kind of like zero in on hey this part of the culture you know you have this and you have this and it was just I'm rambling a little bit but yeah I just really it was re amazing just amazing. Nicole I have a question for you it's actually yeah. for the other ICA leaders um, they're interdisciplinary right so in your case it wasn't just nursing students it was students no. from other colleges as well would you be able to speak for just one minute Nicole about um about that and then I'm very sorry, we do need to open it up to the audience. Yeah, no problem. So it was a mixture, I think primarily of CNHP students, but I guess like inter-major per se was more so because it was, um, we had nursing, healthcare administration, I think nutrition. So I guess it was more so inter-CNHP than it was interdisciplinary just because of the type of the ICA it was. It was more focused on global aging so I, I can see how it was a little difficult for other majors to really be interested. We had we had candidates um, that who were, were quite interested, uh, uh, but from uh, the College of Liberal Arts, I think we had, um, I believe it was a psychology uh, major and I can't, I can't remember the other one. But, but anyway, I, I think we will keep trying to push to make it. Uh, I have an interest in getting a lot of experience. I, I know we want to move up, uh, open, open it up, Jane, but I just want to say thank you to, to you, Nicole, and all the students. It was, for me, fantastic to go on this and have this experience with students. And one thing I'd mention to any faculty out there, like just how great it was. Uh, you know, it is a, a lot of experience. It is a lot of, uh, to keep track of it, it is daunting. All of that's true, but seeing uh, the impact that this trip could make on students, I, I, there's just nothing better as, a, yeah. as an instructor. No, I, and I, I would mention, yeah, support that, yeah. Definitely. We had a student who ha uh, reported back to us that this trip uh, changed her way of thinking such that I believe it was, she said it was responsible for her entering a, a master's in nursing uh, leadership program. So that just really powerful as yeah. an instructor. And if anybody on this uh, call is interested in doing an ICA, don't hesitate to email me and reach out. I'd be more than happy to support it in terms of helping you flush it out. Um, the global program gives you a template to follow, so you're not left up to your own devices anyway. Um, but yeah, I think, and I, I too, Jane, had a very eclectic group, right? I had people, students from all over the uh, uh, Drexel, so I thought that was really, really great. So yeah, if anybody's interested, don't hesitate to reach out. Perfect. We had a comment in the audience um, saying that it was an amazing opportunity for interprofessional experiences, which um, is quite true. Do we have questions from the audience or comments from the audience? Brenda. Hi, Jane. How are you? I'm well. Uh, this thank is you. a great session. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, everyone. Um, I just have a, a couple of questions. I guess, you know, when I listen to this, I wonder, like, what is the time frame? I'm uh, working with something right now, and I just kind of wonder what is the time frame for, like, in gaining assistance, if it was something that can be done, you know, rather in a, um, a short time frame for, like, spring, or if it's something that is more longer term for support for any kind of global engagement. Um, do you mean to create an ICA? I, I Pardon me, I'm sorry, not so much for an ICA, but for like a global learning experience within a course, um, not so much abroad. Of course, we're not traveling right now. So um, anyone within um, on our board would be very glad to help you with that. So generally for a global classroom, we need a lead time of as much as you can give us basically, because there is a lot of planning that goes into it particularly uh, support services from Mike Shelmet and the kind of the IT people at university level because they get the email addresses and verify them of the part that are partners, our collaborating partners. 
and so that they can be enrolled within the Drexel system and Blackboard and they can have full functionality. They of course aren't gonna be graded, they aren't gonna be part of the grade book, but they can have access, full access to the classes that we're teaching. So as much lead time as you can give us, but if you don't have lead time or you just wanna do a little small snippet, just reach out to us and we can help you figure it out. Thanks, Jane, thanks very much. Did you have another question? I just want to add, there is sort of a where to turn, Brenda, hi, how are you? There is sort of a where to turn on the website. So if you're interested in a global classroom, it does give you some of that clarifying data right there on the website. You know, you would need at least four to five months prior, right? In order to set everything up because of registration, if it, you know, if it's going to be involving another university like you're working I know with one in Canada so that reciprocity of signage and contracts and all those kinds of things so if you think about a half of a year then you are golden if you think about three months you're going to be really pressed up against trying to get everything in and submitted so I would recommend if you have any interest for any of you to go to the website and begin to read you know how they they set that up and you'll have that framework for yourself just to well, clarify, Veronica, you. are you talking about the uh, the global office, uh, main Drexel office? Correct. Engagement? Yes. Correct. Yeah, Adam Sun's office. The main and West then West. our SharePoint drive are, is, is also helpful in that we have information about it as well, but they are definitely, uh, theirs is a little bit more instructive. And the classes get listed um, within the main campus directory as a global classroom. So they get, they get a special tag and a special you know, nursing 460 or whatever it is, um, global classroom. So it, it does get listed differently. So your students have an idea about what it is that they're getting involved in. Thank you so much. So we're really interested in getting graduate students, graduate CNHP students involved in our board. We have at least one slot open for a graduate student. If you guys know of anybody, I know lots of advisors and students and faculty out there, please encourage your students and your friends, students encourage your friends to join us. We would love to have as much student engagement as possible. They add such a unique perspective. It's really valuable. Any other questions? If we have a minute, um, Brenda, do you want to tell us a little bit about your project with Canada? Because I know it's been going on for several years and it's a little bit of a different twist of global engagement, but you want to tell us just a titch about it? Sure. And that's, that's sort of why I did not really bring it up because it doesn't fall into either one of the categories right now, but it is kind of unique. So hi, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Brenda Douglas um, in CNHP DNP program director. Um, and for uh, quite some time, we have taken the DNP students to Canada uh, to McMaster University. McMaster's University, which is um, the evidence-based practice, you know, where it all started. And um, I've been very blessed to be able to go the last few years since my role transitioned into DNP program director. And uh, I'll tell you, it's just been such a fabulous opportunity, but of course, COVID puts a stop to that last year. And although we tried to pivot and do some sort of virtual interaction. It just wasn't feasible as our alliance there um, really was a, an in-person university. So they had a lot of pivoting to do very, very quickly. Um, so going forward, we had wanted to do something virtually, you know, didn't know what COVID was gonna look like and obviously it wasn't happening to travel again. So uh, we have been engaged in the last few months and it's really coming to fruition. In fact, a couple of folks on here have been, um, I've reached out and, and they've been involved with myself and another faculty. So we're really um, very, very pleased that somehow we're getting something off. And today we had about a two and a half hour meeting with our, our Canada Alliance and it was just great. Uh, it really started out where initially it was them bringing to us and you know we started talking, I engaged in, how about we do more of a collaborative and, always open to that, very good about that. And today was a beautiful merging of, of really what turned out to be a little bit more of a flip-flop even, and that was recognized that, gosh, Drexel is now offering us a lot more, but we do have a lot more to offer because we've been online for a really long time and, and we do it well. 
Um, so we're coming together with that merging and, and truthfully, they did bring a lot to the table also to offer for speakers and now starting to look at, you know, maybe we expand a little bit further than just the doctoral, uh, doctoral students from there and from here. Um, so we've set up every two weeks to meet. Uh, we're working in the next two weeks on some tasks and one of them is merging those together. We're, we're pairing, um, in fact, I'll be reaching out uh, to you, Jane, as well, in pairing somebody from McMaster with a presentation interactive session with somebody from Drexel. So uh, I, I'm really excited and we're doing it within a course structure, not so much as, you know, a, uh, in classroom, if you will, global, but an experience similar in the short amount of time that we have. Um, I think we, we've narrowed it down some parts of it, you know, we're working through it, but some parts would be that we can't do this all in a week's time or in a session, you know, with COVID, we have to be kind, especially, and be respectful to our students and faculty. So we're looking at maybe four weeks, rolling it out and It'll be in varied ways, you know, starting with an introduction of comparing and contrasting US versus uh, Canadian healthcare systems and maybe some of those roles. So that will likely be pre-recorded that we'll be able to put into our courses. They're gonna do it within their leadership course. We're doing it in with our global perspectives. That'll open up and you know we can have a discussion about that and get our students prepped. And then probably by the end of April, into May that we'll have these sessions. So um, more to come, but that's what we're working on. Brenda, thank you so much. All right. I think we're in, getting close to the end of our time. Other comments or thoughts? Our board members want to say anything else? Our students want to say anything else? partner in crime, Kate Clark. No, I just want to say thank you to everybody for coming. Uh, it's great that we were able to share some of our projects and tips and things, and we would love for you all to connect with us so we can keep moving this agenda forward. So thank you for coming, everybody. Yep. Thanks for coming. Thanks, uh, everybody. Uh, uh, please join us next week for Tuesday topic. There's going to be an email that's going to show up in your inbox in just a second. Uh, which has a brief survey in it, please click on that. I also am including a PDF of the slide deck that was shared in today's presentation. So you have it to refer to later. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, everybody. See you next week. <laughs>